Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone doing? You doing good? God is good. How about that worship? I tell you, I really felt, I was going to say, I didn't want to give too many words during worship, but I felt really strong that uh, one of the things, how many know God wants our hearts? Amen. And that was a weekend. <laughs> Amen. God wants our hearts. And the Bible says in uh, Jeremiah 29, 13, we all know Jeremiah 29, 11, most of us, but Jeremiah 29, 13 says, when you seek me, you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. So reverse that. S- search him half-heartedly. Come to worship kind of whatever, and guess what you're going to get? Kind of whatever worship service. But you come saying, God, I want to know you more. I want to experience you. I want to leave this place a different person. Guess what will happen? God will touch you. Amen? Amen? You get what you give from God. I mean, God draws, but he also wants us. And so I encourage you guys. I love this. Pastor John, my pastor who is with Grace Chapel. Uh, it was kind of the same move that happened with the Calvary movement. It was here in town. Now it's a different church. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's not the same. But they used to say how he'd encourage the people to come to worship service prepared. Because how many know, a lot of us, we kind of have some sin in our life. Does anyone, ever, anyone out there sin? And so sometimes it takes a little time to get kind of defragmented from the week, amen? So how many know it'd be better to kind of get right with God on the way to church so that when you hit it, you can, uh, you can get right into worship, amen? amen? Amen. Because I know none of you fight on the way to church, right? You know, how we know that's some of the best fights that my wife and I have is on the way to church. Okay, but uh, we drive separate now. No, I'm just kidding. But, you know, uh, that's because why? There's a devil. There's a devil that wants to ruin your worship experience. There's a devil that doesn't want you to go to church. You know, I mean, how many of you have gotten ready for church or started to, and then something happens and you go, I'm done. I'm not going to go. And we have to say, I like always that saying, it's an old rock song in the 80s that said, you have to fight for the right to party. Well, if you have to fight for the right to party, which I don't think the devil fights that right, but how many know you have to fight for the right to seek God? Amen? And it's not for the faint of heart. It's for people who say, you know what? How many, how many are a little tired of this world? A little bit. A little tired? of Yeah, there you go. The whole church. You raise your hands on that one. Yay! But so guess what? If we're tired of it, then we need to seek God. Amen? Because only God can change this world. Amen. Amen. Donald Trump is not going to make America great again. Okay? God bless him. I think he's better than the other two, but he's not going to do it. Okay? Jesus is going to make America great again. It's what Jesus did. Amen? So we need to get Jesus back. Amen. There you go. I was going to tell a joke, but the Lord told me not to tell it because I guess it was a little edgy, but... uh, you know, and Kevin told a really good joke on Wednesday, so I don't want to, I'm going to let him just have that small victory for once. But anyway, an overview. Last week we did, um, we had a, a Mother's Day message, but this week we're going back to Daniel. So turn, if you would, in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 8, verse 8. And last, two weeks ago, the message was the vision of the ram and the goat, part one. Now it's the vision of of the ram and the goat, part two. And I want to tell you this real quick, a little, a little thing. How many you know the book of Daniel is not for wimps? Amen? If you're kind of a cotton candy Christian, this is going to be like, whoa! I mean, this is intense. Amen? And, and so just know that. If you're kind of freaked out by it, then listen to it. I mean, I have to, I, I studied, I was up till uh, four in the morning last night studying this, so trust me, so if I just fall asleep, you know what happened. But I want to know what this is, and, and it's not, this is a pretty intense book. I mean, it's so intense that liberal scholars fight it, saying it can't be, it's so accurate, it can't be written when it says it's written. But how many know God is prophetic? God knows the beginning and the end, and we're going to see that again today. So I want to do a quick overview of what we saw when we ended verse 8, part of verse 8 last, two weeks ago. Here it is. Therefore, the male goat grew very great. Does anyone remember what the male goat was? <laughs> there you go. All right. The male goat was Alexander the Great. Amen. He was Alexander the Great. So there's the male goat. He grew very great, right? He, he conquered pretty much the known world in his day. But when, at, before he was age 32, but he became, it says, but when he became strong, the large horn, or the male goat, was broken. If you remember, after defeating Xerxes in Babylon, which was the Medes and the Persians. It was the Persian, Xerxes was Persian. Alexander went on and he kept going. He went south to Israel and when he neared Jerusalem, he was ready to destroy it. 
But then the high priest met him outside of the city of Jerusalem, showed him this passage right here, written, hear this, 200 years before he was born. How many know that would be pretty wild to hear yourself mention the Bible 200 years before you were ever born? For you were even a twinkle in your mom's eye. 200 years, God's talking about you, the great horn and the, and the, and the male goat. And so he, he sees this. The priest shows it to him, this passage written 200, and so convinced was Alexander that this was talking about him, that he spared the city of Jerusalem. How many like that? That's how important it is, hear this, for you and I to have prophetic words. It's important for us. The Bible says the greatest gift is love, but we should pray, 1 Corinthians 14, that we should pray that we might prophesy. And I don't mean prophetic words like Daniel, but we should be able to build up. How many know the Bible says that prophecy is what? It's for what? um, Edification, exhortation, comfort. That's what it's for. And we need that. I want to tell you this. I've told you a hundred stories, but I will tell you. When you are used by God to speak a word, a prophetic word, or a word of knowledge to somebody, it's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. And and how many know, has anyone ever done that? Has anyone ever spoke that? Two of you? Okay, good. But, uh, but, how many, but hear this. I'll never forget. I, I've told you a story, but I'll tell it again for those of you who haven't heard it. I remember I was at a Bible study once, and I saw this girl at the Bible study, and uh, I wasn't married at the time, and so, you know, it's weird when you're a single guy and you give a prophetic word to a girl, because we're like, what are you trying to pick up me? But I was speaking this word to her, and I just said, when I looked at you, I saw uh, an empty hole. I, I just saw your face, and then all of a sudden it turned black, and it was empty. It was just like, you know, kind of like her face is blacked out. And I said that to her, and I'm thinking, this is weird. How many know that's weird, right? If that's not God, you're going to go, okay, psycho, move along, right? <laughs> but I said that word to her, and all of a sudden, she just starts weeping. And she had just realized that she had been molested as a child, and she was struggling with that. It just kind of, God let it come to her, and she was realizing that. And she said she felt, that's how she felt. She felt like I was just an empty shell. How many know that's God saying, I love you and I care about you? Then she was able to be ministered to by the women in the Bible study, and she walked with God. That's pretty cool, isn't it? And we need that. How many know there's people, do you believe there's people in this body right here in this church that are hurting and struggling? There's people saying, you know what, I might, not, I might give up on Christianity, or I might, you know, just maybe I'll go through a divorce, or maybe whatever. And you might, it is you as a Christian can have that word of life to say, you know what, God, use me. You should be walking around, as we're going to see at the end of this message, saying, Lord, use me. I want to be used. And how many know it's not all about you? When you seek for people to love you, when you come to church going, I hope someone loves me today. How many know you're probably not going to get the love you want? Right? But the Bible says in the old King James, the friendly have friends. You want a friend, then be a friend. You want love, then sow love. You want someone to be encouraging you, then encourage someone. And the Bible also says what a man sows, he reaps. And he says, if those who refresh others, they themselves shall be what? Refreshed. So we need to be that. We need to come to church saying, I want to be a blessing, not just be blessed. Hopefully both, but we want to be a blessing too. Amen? Amen? All right. You guys are a little quiet today, but I still love you. Anyway. Here it is. Then he went, so Alexander the Great went into Egypt and founded the Alexandria, and he swept north into present-day Afghanistan. Then he made a run into India, and after conquering India, the male goat, Alexander the Great, went back to Babylon, established the city as his capital, and at this point, remember, Babylon was the, one of the seven wonders of the world, so he's saying, hey, this is a good place to take over. At that point, realizing he had conquered the entire world, if you remember, he did what? He wept. At age 32, he said, I've conquered the whole world. How many of you know that's pretty wild when you're 32 years old and you go, I've conquered the world? Even Trump hasn't done that. I've conquered the world, and I have nothing left to conquer. There's no more Trump towers to put in the world. I mean, can you imagine? I don't know why I'm picking on Trump today. I just love it. So something about that hair, I get jealous to come over. But anyways, um, but, but he goes, and then there was no more words to conquer. And now middle of verse 8. But when he became strong, the large horn was broken. At a party that he threw for his soldiers after they conquered the world, he then returned to Babylon. Alexander became drunk at his party. He walked back to his house in the rain. And, and here this one person said, hey, I read... I read that he died of malaria. How many know that some of this history is quite a while ago, and there's all different versions of history? But this is what two commentaries say, so I'm going to trust. How, how many know I trust 
Biblical commentary is better than I trust Pima or U of A. Amen? Can I say that? So, so I'm going to say so. But, but anyways, he died. We know that for sure. How? But this is what I was told. He's drunk, and he walked back to his house in the rain, fell asleep in his damp, damp clothes, and within three days he died, had a great, great fever, and died of pneumonia at age 32. So the great horn was broken. Alexander was the embodiment of of what the world looks for in a leader. By the time he was 20, Alexander had control of all of Greece. Pretty amazing. 20-year-old having control. Can you imagine? Not just America, but the whole world. I mean, he had control of the whole known world. Amazing. Amazing. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us and continue. Father, we just thank you for your goodness. And I pray, Lord, that every one of us here would just have hearts right now wanting you, that we would be like so many times this week I've been realizing I'm like Martha. I'm worried about what I gotta cook, and well, I don't cook, but I'm worried about all that I gotta do. And yet Martha said, Jesus, tell Mary to help me. Tell Mary to help me. And she says, Mary's chosen the better thing. Not that we shouldn't cook and prepare, but he's saying, she's sitting at my feet. That's the better thing. Lord, help us to sit at your feet right now. Amen. Help us to wait on you and just say, Lord, we just give you this time to speak to us. We pray that your word would not just be, yeah, whatever, I know that. But you would really, we'd have hearts to say, speak, Lord. Speak to me. Convict me of areas I need conviction. Encourage me where I need areas of encouragement. Speak salvation to me if I'm not saved. And if I'm not walking like I should, then draw me back to a recommitment of my life to be a disciple. I pray that everyone in this room would be encouraged by your word and by your Holy Spirit. And I would just be a part of that, but it would be you that's doing the work. I would be the vessel that you're working in and through. And so, Lord, we commit this time to you. As your word says, whatever you commit to the Lord, it shall be established. May your perfect will be established. And when other churches in this country are getting away from the word, may you give this church a greater love for your word. Amen? Give us a love for your word. Give us a passion for your word. And let us, Lord, want to be doers of it. Not just hearers, but effectual doers. And so bless your people. Bless this time. And Lord, I pray that it would have, as you said, your word does not return void, but it accomplishes everything you set it forth to do. And I pray today your perfect will would be set forth in your people today through your powerful word. In Jesus' mighty name. And I agreed with a loud amen. Amen. Woo, good job. All right, end of verse eight. And in place of it, Alexander the Great, four notable ones, horns, came up towards four winds of heaven. Following Alexander's death, his empire was split by force into four regions, and each, each overseen by one of his four generals. They broke it up into four sections, and they split it. And here it is, verse 9. And out of one of them came a little horn. Now let me say it real quick. Do you remember, for those of you who were here, and if you weren't, you can listen to all these things online if you want to catch up. But hear this. The little horn of, verse, of uh, chapter 7 was who? The Antichrist. Okay, so that's the little horn. But now there's another little horn, so you're like, you gotta, this is where it can get complicated. So now we're going to talk about a new little horn, and so keep your ears open to hear the difference of the new little horn. It came a little horn which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the glorious land. Out of the four generals who had taken over Alexander's empire came one who is called The little horn, he's not the Antichrist, but he's like a type of the Antichrist. This little horn uh, expands his his borders, moves towards the place called the Glorious Land. Does anyone have any idea who the Glorious Land is? What do you think that is? Israel, right? Israel. It's the land flowing with milk and honey. It's It's Israel. He's moving towards Israel. And hear this, guys. I've been to Israel. Has anyone been to Israel? You look at Israel and you go, I don't know why this is such a hot place. Because I look at it, I mean, Tucson, I think, is prettier than Israel. But yet, why is it a hot place? Because Jesus is going to come back and rule and reign there. So Satan wants to destroy that place. That's why Satan has his eye on Israel. Because Jesus is going to rule and reign from David's throne in Jerusalem. So guess what? Satan's going to try to mess up Jerusalem. And we have to know that. That's why it'll always be, you know, have you know, since I've been a kid, how many, 
of my age, around 50, that Middle East has always been a hot topic. Never has there been peace, never has there been easy. And you just think, what, what? You go there, and they all have Jerusalem songs, so it pretty much looks the same. So there's nothing like, this is beautiful. It's not like Maui, where you can understand why people would fight for it. You go, huh. But it's because Jesus is going to come back, and so the enemy knows that, and he wants to try to mess it up, because if he can drive out the Jews, right? And you heard, what do the Muslims say? They want to push Israel into the sea because why? Who is that inspiring that? The enemy, because the enemy does not want Israel to exist because if he doesn't, they, then Satan thinks, hey, then Jesus can't come back because there's no Jews. There's no Jerusalem, right? You get it? And so out of these four drums comes this little horn, expands his borders, verse 10. And it grew up to the host of heaven and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. Verse 11, he even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Verse 12, because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to, to oppose the daily sacrifice. And, and hear that, because of transgression. Israel, I don't want to go into it for time, but this little horn is going to invade Israel. And you know why this little horn is going to invade Israel? Because the priests were fighting. These two priests were fighting. The high priests were fighting who could be it. And they were getting people to murder. And they were getting people to fight and, and, and speak evil against this, each other. And so there was evil amongst the priesthood. How many know what will destroy America is not Al-Qaeda, but is because of our sin? Amen. Amen? And we need to know that, right? If my people call by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. So that's the key. It's not if Obama will get saved or do everything right. It's if my people will do what's right and humble themselves, then I will heal the land. Amen? Amen? So it has nothing to do. So because of their transgression, God allowed their enemies to come in. Do you get that? And so I hope if you like, does everyone like America still, right? Then if you don't want it to get worse, then we need to turn to God and say, God, you're our defense. You're our protection. You're our blessing. And we don't trust in a man. We trust in you. Amen. Amen? And so that's it. Because of the transgression, verse 12, the army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifice and cast truth down to the ground. And he did all this and prospered. I mean, no, God will allow evil to prosper over us if we do not seek him. He will. And people say, oh, no. Oh, yes. The Bible says God disciplines those he loves. And he will say, if you don't want to come by love, then I will allow discipline to draw you. And how many know a good spanking will draw you sometimes? <laughs> I'm sorry, Lord. Right? I mean, you know, and I always pray this prayer. I always pray the Psalms 34. Don't be like the horse or mule that has to be led by bit and bridle, pain, or he will not follow thee. How many would like to just follow because he's good? Amen? That's why we should come. Not because the world's cr going down, but because we know. We see it's going down, but we know the answer is Jesus. This is exactly what happened in history. One of the four generals, the four horns from the Seleucid family, that's one of the generals' family that broke off, controlled Babylon and Syria. And out of that family came an infamous individual who the Bible calls the little horn. And he's a type of Satan or a picture or forerunner, you could say. He's not the same little horn as I said in chapter 7, but he's the little horn which came out, not the little horn that came out of the Ten Nation Confederation, which is the Antichrist. This little horn comes out of the Seleucid family, which is one of the generals that broke off, the four generals of, of, of Alexander the Great broke off and took a section of the kingdom or the empire. And he is a picture or a foreshadowing or an illustration or a previous attraction, I shouldn't say attraction, but a, but a kind of a preview of the real Antichrist. And how many know that's pretty wild that God, you know, I don't know, you know, I mean, God is sovereign, but this person sinned. But how many know this person, that kind of gives you an idea that this, the Antichrist spirit is all through all generations. Amen? I heard someone once say it this way. Satan doesn't know when the Lord's going to return. He knows he's going to return. He just doesn't know when. So he always has someone ready in the wings to be an Antichrist type person. People say Hitler was like a type of Antichrist. Stalin, because this devil doesn't know. So that same spirit comes in. Well, this same spirit that was in this little horn is going to be the same spirit that is in the actual Antichrist. 
Does that make sense? And that's why they're so similar. It's not that God made them be similar. It's because it's the same demonic spirit. So anyways, this little horn comes on, the Seleuc- is part of the Seleucid family. He is a picture of the Antichrist. The little horn has already come, and this was found, and I know this is a lot of history, but here, be patient with me, 175 B.C. to 164 B.C., this little horn was known as Antiochus Epiphanes. Do we have that up? Antiochus Epiphanes, and that's his name. You can look him up. I'm studying it. Antiochus Epiphanes, and Antiochus, his name was um, he was the um, came. He was the leader of Syria and Babylon. He called himself. Hear this, Theos Epiphanes, which means what? God manifested. This general believed that he was God manifested or God incarnate. He believed he was a god. Does that sound like anyone else you know? Satan, right? And so he's he's saying, "I am God. I am Theos Epiphanes." He called himself. Others called him Antiochus Epiphanes, which also can mean the shining one. The Jews, aware of this madman, called him Antiochus Epinanes, which means Antiochus the insane one. You know that? I mean, size. I guess, you know, I I don't know, I didn't know this, but uh, I can't remember, someone helped me out, but Bush Jr. would always call um, Saddam, how do you say it, Saddam? What? Saddam, which means a horse is behind. If you would say Saddam, if you would say it the other way, it would be noble, something. But he'd always say it so it means a horse's rear end. And they did that on purpose. He did that to annoy him. And how we know the Jews the same way said, yeah, you're, you're Antiochus Epinanes, which is kind of a play on words, which means you're insane. You're the insane one. They recognized that he was deranged and that his history confirms that he truly was. He began to expand his empire by conquering everything he set his eyes upon, including Israel. He had such hatred for the Jews. That also shows his Antichrist spirit. Because hear this, guys. Whenever people hate the Jews, what's behind that? It's a demonic spirit. When you see a skinhead and you go, why does this person hate the Jews? It's because of the devil. Amen? It, it's why. Why would you hate the Jews? People just, all throughout history, people hate the Jews. And why? And hear this, guys. I hope none of us hate the Jews. I've heard people say, they're no longer in this church, but people used to say, oh, I can't believe what those, those, those Jews do to those poor, those poor um, uh, Iranians or those poor uh, what's it, the Palestinians. Okay, you know the Jews had the land before the Palestinians. Okay, you know that? I mean, we have to know that. And if you think that, remember, they're the apple of his eye. And if we hate them, guess what? You know, God says in Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those who bless Israel, and I will curse those who, bless, who curse Israel. How many know we need to be blessing Israel? And do you notice, people that are kind of liberal and aren't into Christ, they talk a good talk with Israel because they know it gets some votes, but you see their heart is kind of against Israel. Do you not see that? But we should be people that are always praying. And I'll tell you, I, I, I can, I'm just filled with the Spirit. No, I'm just but I, I went there, and there was this Hasidic Jew in, in, uh, in the airport in Israel. And, and he was really, you could tell he was rushing, and he had the curls and everything. And, and he had you know, the hat, and he looked like a little mafioso guy. And, and I said to him, hey, you want to go ahead? There was like 50 of us. I said, do you want to go ahead of us? And he goes, he goes, are you Jewish? I go, no. I go, well, I, my, my dad is. But no, I said, uh, but, but I said, no. I said, just go ahead. He goes, thank you. And you could just see he was so shocked that somebody would be kind to him. And that's kind of how the Jews feel a lot of times. I mean, that's how they get treated a lot of times. And so I thought, man, that's pretty cool. And I just had a heart for the Jews. I mean, I thought it was cool. I mean, I don't know what it is. Something about that. I think I'm Italian. You know, so when I see him in those black suits and little hats, it, it reminds me of mafioso. So I kind of like, no, okay. But anyway. <laughs> So where was I? We gotta get moving here. Where is it? Um, um, he tried to expand his, uh, Israel. He had such hatred as for the Jews and demanded that all of the holy writings, all the scriptures, all the scrolls be burned, claiming that he instead was God. And he built a statue of himself and put it in the temple. Does that remind you of anything? What's the Antichrist going to do? He's going to put a statue in the rebuilt temple and say worship it. And the statue is going to speak and 
speak. A sta- how many, how many, has anyone seen a statue speak? That's going to be pretty amazing. And so people are going to say, oh, this has got to be God, and they're going to worship it. Same exact thing. Isn't it amazing? And so he puts a statue in the temple, and when the Jews revolt, and you can read this if you want for note takers, Revelation 13, 15. I'm not going to go there. Just write it down if you want to look at later. That's where he talks about the Revelation talks about the Antichrist doing the same thing. When the Jews revolted and said, no way, he killed 40,000 Jews on the spot that day. Boom, killed them in one single day. Historians say he killed possibly in the months to come about 100,000, maybe a little more uh, Jews because uh, they revolted against him setting up this statue in the temple. Then he got angry because they revolted, and so then he butchered a pig, right? Jews aren't supposed to have pork. Butchered a pig on the altar of the temple, smeared the blood all over the temple, defiling it, and then forced the priests, some commentators say, to drink the remainder of the pig's blood, which would what? Defile them. And so they were just, so he was just a very cruel man. He was a madman, and he's a perfect picture of the Antichrist that is yet to come. And we need to know that. How, how many, like me, do not want to be around for the Antichrist? And so when you hear this, don't get afraid. Oh, the Antichrist is coming. If you're in Christ, you are going to be raptured before the Antichrist comes to see. How many are excited about that? Amen. So if you're not saved, get saved so you don't have to stick around and meet the Antichrist because he's not going to be a very cool guy. Anyways, verse 13. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the certain one, that certain one, Uh, who is speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, or the abomination of desolation, you could say, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? Meaning, how long will this be? Verse 14, and he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. How many know that's true for also our world? Maybe not 2,300 days, but someday this world will be cleansed again. Amen? Someday Jesus is going to come back and rule and reign, and we're going to be with him, and this world will be perfect. How many long for that? I look at this world, and I look at our desert, and I go, how beautiful it is. And it's cursed. Can you imagine this land blessed with no thorns, no thistles, no rattlesnakes, no weeds, right? And this kind of weed too? No. No weed, right? Where it's just a godly land. Can you imagine How beautiful, and when Jesus is ruling, when there's perfect justice, and guess what, we get to be a part of that, because guess what, there will be the tribulational saints that make it through the tribulation that live, and that's who will be ruling and reigning, governing with Jesus, because guess what, we'll be perfected, but they'll they'll be like us, and we will kind of help manage the the world for Jesus. How many like to do that? Pretty cool. And uh, under a good government, that really will be change, and good change. There he is, right there. So, um, where is it? Um... So what are these 2,300 days? Well, when Antiochus Epiphanes began his reign on September 6, 171 B.C., a man named Matthias Maccabean, Matthias Maccabean from the village of Modin, refused to give in to his pressure. And he, just like Shadrach and Meshach Abednego, he fought and said, no way, I'm not bowing. I'm not going to worship your statue. I'm not going to do this. I refuse to submit to you. For that, he was killed. And how many know, we need to sometimes be willing to be put in that place. Do you know the word martyr? We always think, what do we think when we heard martyr? We think martyr means what? Killed for Christ, right? A martyr, someone who died for God. That's not what martyr means. Martyr means a faithful witness. Amen? It means a faithful witness who's so faithful, he's even willing to die. Amen? Do you get the difference? So guess what? Now, we shouldn't say, hey, I hope I die today, but we should say I'm going to be a faithful witness even if it means my life. Amen. Because why? Why well, you say, Pastor Craig, well, I, I like my life. So I, don't want to, I, I want to pass the least resistance. Because Jesus said what? If you deny me before men, I would deny you before my Father in heaven. Yes. Now, I don't know about you, but I was just saying today in prayer, at the beginning of service, I was saying, think of how evil it is when I, a sinful man, and you sinful people, we are embarrassed of a perfect, holy Jesus. Yes. Amen? Now, you can be embarrassed of me as your pastor, and I can be embarrassed of some of you. But for us to be embarrassed about Jesus, how many know that's pretty sad? That's sad. And how many of Jesus could look at you, really? You're embarrassed of me? Well, guess what? Now I'm embarrassed of you, and I will say, depart from me, I never knew you. 
We have to hear that, guys, that this isn't an option if we're going to be a faithful witness. A witness, if we are truly saved by Jesus, and how many know he said he's bought our life with, the pres- with his blood, and we are his, and we should be willing to die if that means, if, if being a faithful witness means that. Amen? Amen. And we need to get back, because I was just saying this today. PC is pushing us in the closet. It is, is it not? We can't even talk about we're talking now, can you believe this, that we're talking about a guy going into a girl's bathroom saying he's a girl? Psycho! Can you believe that? If I told you 20 years ago, we're going to be talking about dude looks like a lady, and he can say I'm a girl when he's not a girl, and he has male parts, and he has to go, he can shower with your daughter, and you would say, oh, come on. And why has that happened? Because we, the church, have shut up, and we've gone in the closet, and they've come out. Guess what, church? We need to come out of the closet and speak the truth in love and say, guess what? When a guy has a penis, he doesn't go in the girl's bathroom. But you see, that doesn't make me grow the church real big, does it? Because we go, let's just be quiet. But hear this, guys. Then don't complain when the girl goes crazy. Because how will they know unless a preacher sent? How will they know unless you speak and know what the word says and speak the truth in love? Amen? And we allowed this. This happened on our watch. And we can either just bury our head in the sand and just watch TV and forget about it. Or we can say, you know what, God? Here I am. I want to be that faithful witness again. I want to speak the truth in love. I'm not going to be harsh. I don't say demonstrate and say, you know, kill homosexuals. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying speak the truth, what God's word says about this. Because how many know people are counting on you to be a witness to them? There's people going to hell because you're not speaking the truth. Amen? And I want to tell you this. I'd rather offend people now and have them change than have people be offended with me for all eternity because I love them all the way to hell. You get it? Because I didn't say, you know what, bro? God loves homosexuals, but he loves you so much he wants to change you and show you the way he designed you to live. And people go, oh, but guess what? If you do it in a spirit of love that you really want to see them live right with God, most people who want truth are going to go, thank you. I, I did a show, I told you, at, a, at IBTs. Anyone heard of IBTs? It's a gay bar. I hope you go, no one's going to say, yeah. I, no. <laughs> but I went there in town, 4th Avenue, and I spoke the truth. And I thought I was going to get beat up. I planned on getting beat up. And I did this show, and these guys said to me, all of them, 25 guys said, you know what, Pastor Craig? They said, I would have never, I I don't agree with you, but the way you spoke the truth in love, it really opened my eyes. And if I ever was going to be a Christian, it'd be because of the way you spoke the truth to me. How many know that's what people are looking for? They're looking for you to speak the truth in love, right? You know, speak the truth in love. That's all free. Thank you. All right, there you go. Better get moving here. All right, here we go. So, so anyways, so this uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he refused to submit. For this he was killed, but hear this. He had five sons. I have two sons. You guys would protect me, right, if someone heard me. Five sons, this, this, this uh, Math- Matthias, uh, Maccabee, Maccabean. And so they, these, these five sons, led by Judah, the oldest son, were incensed that his father was killed. And with guerrilla tactics, they began to attacking the soldiers of Antiochus, Epiphanes, and others joined and the Maccabean revolt was underway. And on December 25th, 165 BC, they drove Antiochus and all his men out of the land. Judah and his men then went into the temple, cleansed it from all its defilements, washed the walls, cleansed it from all of Antiochus's defilements, got out the statue, and hear this, they were so excited to get the temple back they hadn't had it for 2,300 days. They, they lit the menorah. If you remember in the, in the Holy of Holies, there's the, there's the altar of incense right in front of the Holy of Holies. Then there's the showbread. I think the showbread's over here, the, the, 12, the bread every week that represents the 12 tribes of Israel. And then there's the menorah. And the menorah is, lights the area, and it's oil. It's, it's not candles. People say it all the time, but it's just little holders that had like uh, olive oil and oils in it with wicks, and that's what burned. Well, they got so excited, they lit it, but they didn't realize we only have oil for one day. Well, to make the holy oil, to purify it and make it right, takes eight days. So they went, uh-oh, we lit the menorah. You can't blow it out and start over. So we, they, it was always supposed to stay lit. So they're like, what are we going to do? So then what happened is that they prayed. They prayed that the, that the, um, the oil would last for long enough for them to make new oil. And miraculously, guess what? It lit. It stayed lit. 
And the answer to their prayer was answered. The menorah burned for eight days, and it only had a, one day's worth of oil and, until the new oil was ready. This celebration, how many know what that's called? Hanukkah, the Feast of Lights or the Festival of Lights. It's the celebration of the miracle of them getting back to the temple, then relighting the menorah too fast and not having oil, but God miraculously kept it lit. And hear this, this is where it really gets cool. I know I'm telling you a lot of history here, but hear this. September 6, 171 B.C., when Tychicus came into power in Israel, and to December 25th, 165 B.C., it was exactly 2,300 days. It's almost like the Bible is the Word of God. I say that very facetiously, hear me. But you hear that? Do you want to hear this? Every other holy book has prophecies, but they don't come true. The Mormons have tons of prophecies, but they have been, not one of them has been proven. And they change the scripture. They believe it's evolving scripture. Guess what? People will say, oh, this didn't happen, this didn't happen, and we see it happens, it happens, it happens, it happened, it happened. How many know that's pretty amazing? And hear this, to top it off, that accurate 2,300 days, it was told 350 years before Antiochus Epiphanes was ever born. That's pretty good. And now do you see why liberal scholars say there's no way it could have been written that long ago because there's just no way. But how many know your God is an all-knowing God and he can prophesy things to you and show you things and show Daniel things that no one else could know. And that's pretty awesome. Amen. Can we give the Lord a clap on that? Pretty good. Verse 15, then it had happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the mean, meaning uh, that suddenly there stood before me one having an appearance of a man Verse 16, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. I like that. Gabriel, you help this guy, he doesn't get it. Gabriel, make this man understand this vision. Verse 17, so he came near to where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end or the end times. The book was told to be closed because it was, you know, what, 2,300 years ago or longer. That's a long time. But guess what? How many know the book is open now? Revelation says open the books now. We're to know the last days. You're to know what's going on. And guess what? This now, if you don't understand Daniel, you're not going to understand Revelation. If you don't understand Revelation, you're not going to understand Daniel. You need both of them. And guess what? We're seeing what the Bible says. So now the book is open. We can understand it. And now we're living. How many believe we're living in the last days? And so you need to know this because if you don't, you're going to be freaked out and you could be deceived. You really could be deceived. You really could believe. Hey, I mean, look at how our, look at the political climate of our country. I mean, it's crazy, is it not? And could you see some world leader coming on saying, here I come and we could go, okay, this sounds great. But we need to be aware when someone comes from, from, someone comes from the 10 Federation, you know, from, from European Union and says, hey, we have a wonderful plan for life. We need to go, what? oh, you know, be careful. Amen. Daniel was told the vision of the ram with two horns was the Medes and the Persians that took over Babylon. He was told the goat, which is what? Was, was Alexander the Great with a single horn and the little horn. Antiochus Epiphanes rising up, or I'm sorry, the little horn here is the Antichrist, and the ten horns spoke not only of the time of Antiochus, but later event that would come in, in other words, the Antiochus, again, is a foreshadowing of the Antichrist. He's already come, but he's a picture of what the Antichrist is going to be, and guess what? Worse than Antiochus. Amen? And that's why you have to make sure that if you have a loved one or someone who's known Christ and fallen away, you need to tell them you don't want to go through the, the, the last day. You don't want to go through the tribulation. I've had people tell me, even in our church, say, hey, you know what, I want to go through the, the tribulation because if I do, I'll know God's real. Well, I love what one pastor said. He said, if you can't live for God in the life situations, how are you going to live for God in the death situations? When, when, when you have to take a mark to eat, and you have to worship a statue or you'll die. How, how are you going to do that? If you can't live for Christ now, how, how are you going to believe that lie? And guess what? The answer is live for Christ now. Amen? Live for Christ and encourage people. Pray for people. Tell people we're in the last days because we really are. Skip now to verse 24 or we'll be here all day. So here it is. And, and a lot of that's kind of a review of all the people we've talked about earlier So uh, in the last message. So we can skip it. His power shall be mighty. But not by his own power, 
He should destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He should destroy the mighty and also the holy people. The Antichrist, now he moves in talking about the real Antichrist, and he says the Antichrist will perform a host of signs and wonders. And that's another thing I see too. Hear this, guys. We want signs and wonders. Amen? Amen? We do. The Bible says these signs will follow those who believe, Mark 16. But, or, but we have to believe this. If we just chase after signs and wonders, how many know we're vulnerable? The Bible says these signs shall follow those who believe. We should follow the word of God and follow God, and signs and wonders should follow. Never should we follow signs and wonders. Amen? Because Jesus said you'll know them by their fruit. And just some people say, well, look at the great sign this person did. He has to be of God. No, you don't. Right? If somebody says, does macro signs and says, I am God and sets up a, a statue of himself in the temple, how many of you can go ding, 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 not God? And you have to realize just because he does miracles doesn't mean it's always godly. Amen? I mean, think about that. I never heard this before, but a commentator said, remember Matthew 7 20? When he says, in the last days, people say, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we heal in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? And Jesus doesn't say, well, you didn't really do that. He says, depart from me. I never knew you. Those who do iniquity, you know, the, I never knew you, and, and depart from me, those who do iniquity are those who don't live for my Father's will. Hear that. He didn't deny that they did miracles. Now, I don't know how you do miracles without Jesus, but they did it. Maybe it was the devil, but guess what? That wasn't proof that they were saved. It was knowing Jesus, right? And if you know Jesus, hear this, guys. I said this to the, to the youth this, this uh, week. How many know this? If you say you love Jesus and yet you hate people, you know, and you go, how you doing? How many know you, you don't know God? Because 1 John says, anyone, God is love, and if anyone is of God, loves. So you want to know how you know you're in God? Because you, maybe you were like me and kind of, but when you come to go, hi, how you doing? You know? People used to think I was going to kill them because I, I went from a drug dealer to being saved, and I go, hi. And people go, Craig's going to kill me. He just gave me the smile of death. You know? No, but I was truly happy, right? And that's how we should be. We should be a little bit, hey. You know, we should be, how you doing? You know? We should be filled with love. We should, this should be one of the happiest places on earth besides Disneyland, that you feel loved because we are so filled with God. Amen? Amen? And we need that. We need to be filled with God. But anyways, so Antichrist will perform signs and wonders, but the power will actually be Satan. And hear this. There's Satan, which is trying to be like God. Then there's the Antichrist, who's a picture of what? Trying to be the reverse of Christ. And then there's the false prophet, which is a picture of what? False picture of the Holy Spirit. They, how many know Satan mimics? He doesn't do anything new. He just mimics. So he says, oh, I want to be like God. So that's Satan. Then the, uh, the, the beast is like the Antichrist. Or an Antichrist is like Jesus. And then the false prophet is like the Holy Spirit or the forerunner. Verse 25. Through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. And he shall exalt himself in his heart and shall destroy many in their prosperity. How many know that? Their prosperity, because why? We're, we're captured by stuff, right? How many know that? We, we get caught up in pleasure. And sometimes our prosperity can be the very thing that keeps us from God. It says, they'll destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes. Who's that? Jesus. But he shall be broken without human means. I like that. Antichrist will claim to be God. Even as Antiochus Epiphanes claimed to be God, and even as Satan did in Isaiah 14, 14, remember he said, I will be like the Most High God? And what happened? God, with his little pinky, said, I'm going to get that, he says, get that ant off my picnic table, and poof, and popped him out of heaven. And how many know that's going to happen again to him? But off the earth. Initially, the Antichrist will come as a man of peace. He's not going to come, you know, He's going to come. I love the title of this book. I didn't read the book, but it said, The Beautiful Side of Evil. Amen? The Bible says, Satan disguised himself as an angel of light, and his followers disguised himself as righteous men. If you saw Satan the way he was, you would run. So Satan comes as high. He's like the, he's like the ultimate car salesman. You know? How you doing? What, what can I do to get you into sin today? No, I mean, that's what he does. He, just, he, he will work you like there is no, what? Oh, okay, I was like, what? I said something wrong? No. He's going to solve all the problems of the Middle East, and I've told you about that, how he can maybe make it where the temple and the, the Dome of the Ra, or the, 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 the Mosque of Omar can be together. Um, 
can ask me later if you don't know what I mean. Um, solving all the economic tensions in the world. But in the middle of the tribulation, three and a half years in, he'll show his true colors, just like Antiochus Epiphanes, and he will come on the scene and he'll say, worship me. And if those who don't, blood will flow, heads will roll. According to 2 Thessalonians 2.4 and Matthew 24.15, the abomination of desolation, when Antichrist sets up his image in the temple, the remade temple, the temple, how many know the temple is going to be rebuilt? They already have all the instruments made. They even have the money set aside. They just need to figure out how to get back on the temple mount. They've even had Jews. I was told by the, the head of the Sanhedrin, who's the guy, I forget his name, Rabbi something, I was talking to the head guy, and he says, we've had people on the Dome of the Rock ready to blow it up. But we said, no, because it would cause, you know, it's the third most holy place in the Muslim faith. It could cause a little trouble. And he says, no. But he goes, I said, so what are you going to do with that? And he calls it the, the Dome of the Abomination. And he says, he goes, it must be removed. Now, you know, it, I don't think it's just going to be removed without a trouble. So guess what? I think the Antichrist is going to make a peace treaty and kind of, as I've told you, you could build where the... Uh, Dome of the Rock is, it's outside the courts of the Gentiles. You could build a temple right next to it. So it's possible that the Antichrist will manage that deal or broker that deal that will be a win-win supposedly for everyone. And so when Antichrist sets up his image, demands to be worshipped, anyone who doesn't will be jeopardized, will jeopardize their life. And at the Battle of Armageddon, he talks about Revelation 19.11, Antichrist will have the audacity to have... <laughs> I don't know, the brazenness or stupidity to wage war against Jesus himself. But he'll be broken without any help from us. How I many like that? Jesus is going to just rock his world. He'll be broken apart from any human help. Jesus doesn't need our help. He's going to take care of the enemy single-handedly. And hear this, I love this, with his fiery eyes. I always love this when people say, you know, Jesus is such a, he's just such a loving, merciful God. He's just precious. Okay, he is loving, okay, but how many know he's also intense and a just God? Okay, it says these fiery eyes, these flames of fire. I believe this is my opinion, so it's right. No, but in my opinion is those fiery eyes, to you and I, those fiery eyes will be like a moth to the flame. They'll just draw us in. But to those fiery eyes, those who are not in Christ, those fiery eyes will burn you up. They'll be like laser beams. And he says he'll, he'll have the fiery eyes. He talks about that in Revelation 1 and also in Revelation uh, 19. But... And I also says he'll have a sword coming out of his mouth. Think about that. This same Jesus who said to the woman caught in adultery, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Look at those words of life. But how many know when he's also just judge, when he's the coming king, he will judge with his words and he'll be able to just speak. Just like he spoke the world into existence, how many know Jesus could speak you out of existence and say, gone. And it says, or, or blow apart, because guess what? I've seen, has anyone been to Armageddon? The Valley of Armageddon? Have you been there, Dwayne? The Valley of Armageddon is just picture Tucson. Stand on Mount, right on the corner of Push Ridge here, or whatever the mountain would be right on the corner, and look of all Tucson and picture Tucson with no houses, just empty fields, and picture that blood up to the horse's bridle about four feet. I don't know how Jesus is going to do it, but with the sword, he's going to just, I don't know, people just, remember he says he holds all things together? Maybe he'll just go, no more holding together. Woof, and that will be it. And I want to be on Jesus' side. That's all I can say. All right? Verse 26. And we're almost done. And guys, look at me. You've done a great job. Give yourselves a little clap there. Good job. The vision of the evenings and mornings which was told is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. So he's saying again, seal it up, but now it's open to us, as it says in Revelation. Verse 27, and I, Daniel, fainted <laughs> and was sick. How many know this was so overwhelming to Daniel? He was like, uh, I mean, he just like, I can't take it. For the days, uh, sick for days. Afterwards, I arose and went about the king's business. Hear that, that's key, the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. The vision was so real to Daniel, it was so clear to Daniel, that it literally made him physically sick. It made him faint. It made him just kind of wilt. He, he, and because he didn't completely understand its meaning. He didn't completely get it. He, and he's probably, some commentator said he's probably going, God, why are you allowing this? But as I said to you earlier, God will allow things to happen to us when we disobey. 
to get our attention. And I pray that our church, I pray that this church and others like it will say, I want to be a a horse or mule that doesn't have to be led by pain. I want to be led by love, amen? I want to be led by your spirit, not because uh, it's constant frustration and pain. I want to be led because I have the wisdom of God to know he's good and I should trust him, amen? Maybe you're saying right now, you know, maybe you can relate to this. Maybe you can relate to Daniel. And you're saying, I don't get this, Craig. These horses, these chickens, these goats, I don't get it. You know, I don't get the little horns, the difference between the one little horn, the other one, the ten toes, the rams, the goats, the ten federation, confederation. I don't get it. And I'm completely confused. And, you know, good for you. I, I have that effect on people. <laughs> okay. But, uh, you know, you might say I'm confused. And, and that's okay. It's okay to be confused. This made Daniel sick and faint. So if he could be, and he's a pretty smart guy. He ran all of, of, uh, of Babylon. These chapters will affect you just as it did Daniel. But hear this. Whether or not you can identify the ram and the goat, whether you can identify the ten toes, whether you can identify the ten European Union, God is saying in the book of Daniel, hear this, wake up, church. He's saying, wake up. We're not playing games anymore. This is the fourth quarter. Wake up, guys. That's what I pray, and I believe God would say, and Daniel would say, get, that we're in the last days. And this is about eternal destinies, because hear this, guys, a lot of people say, well, we've always been saying it's the last days. Chuck Smith was saying it's the last days. That was 50 years ago. But how many know this? Every day we stand this earth, we're closer to the last days than we were. And what does Jesus say? When you say, oh, it's just like it's always been, that's when you need to watch out. But you know what I mean? It's when you think, he's coming tomorrow. Then he's probably not coming tomorrow. But guess what? It's when you kind of lose heart. So no, my point is, when you're tempted to lose heart, that ah, just might as well do whatever I want. Jesus ain't going to come back for probably a thousand years. I love what the old Baptist used to say. I was an old Baptist. I was a saved Baptist. Live, believe God could come back tomorrow, but live like he's coming back, not coming back for a thousand. Plan like he's not coming back for a thousand years. Amen? We should live because if we believe that, and it's true, then the Bible says we'll live, we'll, this belief will keep us pure, just as Jesus is pure. Because why? He could come back. And you don't want to get caught doing, you don't want to be on your computer doing something you shouldn't. Hi, Jesus. You don't want to do that. Right? And, but you also don't want to be living like there's no tomorrow and racking, you know, people do when they believe the Lord's coming back, when they've said the date, they've racked up their credit cards and sold their house and partied. I mean, that's a bummer. Uh-oh. You know? Imagine being the pastor that's done that. They've done that a lot of times. You know, uh, there's been a few people where they just sell everything and rack up credit, bar, credit cards to leave it for the worldly people. But guess what? Ding, ding, it's you because we don't get to do that. But anyways, we need, it, we need to worry about, be concerned about the eternal destiny of our friends and family members and coworkers. We're talking about people that, who don't know Christ. And hear this, guys. The Bible says he who has the Son has life. But he who does not have a son does not have life. And we have to believe that. Amen? I, I was watching this week, John, Can uh, not John Candy, uh, Chris Farley. I was watching his documentary. And I was going, man, he was so funny. I liked him. He's chubby like me. I relate to him. Hey. You know. But I realized that guy is in hell. He died a heroin addict and cocaine and heroin, just like John Belushi. He died with a prostitute. He was he left, she left him dead on a linoleum floor in his apartment. And I just went, oh my goodness, that man is in hell. And I don't believe it. I don't go, oh my goodness, that man's in hell. And there's people around me that are kind of like him, and I need to be telling them about Jesus. Do, do you, can you say amen? amen. I just kind of go through life, hey, bummer, you don't know Jesus, bummer. I don't go, oh my goodness, my aunt and uncle are going to hell if they don't get know Jesus. And if you believe that, that the Lord could come back and this could be a game changer, you're going to be, what's the word? You're going to be passionate to share Jesus. You're not going to be so worried about, it. think about you moms especially. If you see a little kid in the road right out here and you, you wouldn't go, gosh, I hope he doesn't get hit. What would you do, mom? Run and go, oh! And that's what we should be doing with those around us. And we should not worry about freaking out and grabbing them and say, I just, I don't want to offend you, but I got to tell you, that you need Jesus in these last days. You need to give your life or you need to recommit your life. And how many know, that's the great commission of Jesus. Matthew 28, 18. He said what? Go and make disciples. 
That's what he told you to do. He didn't say go and prosper, go get a home in our valley, go party like a rock star. He said, hear this, now you've been saved, now go and tell others about the good news and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. That's what you do. Make disciples of all nations. Amen? Amen. People that we love and care about are going through, that if they don't know Jesus, they're going to go through the great tribulation unnecessarily. Suffering, great persecution, and finally, if they don't know Jesus, they're going to probably be eternally separated from a loving God. We as believers have a very important job, and that is to be ambassadors for Christ. They tell others the good news. And hear this, guys. It's good news. Amen? Amen. I don't care what the PC world tells you. It's good news. God so loved the world that while you and I were punk sinners, he died for us. And guess what? All you have to do is say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Admit the obvious and ask him in and your whole life can be changed. How I many know that's good news? Well, I don't want to give my life to Jesus. Well, okay, then you're not going to be happy with your eternity. Amen? I mean, maybe don't say it like that, but hear this. we got to believe it. It's not, Jesus is not a way. He is the only way. And if you believe that, it will make you a radical follower of God. It'll make you say, you know what? I want my aunt and uncle saved. I want my coworker. I want my, fr- I want my husband or wife saved. How many know that? The Bible talks about one will be taken away. One will be left. Does anyone want their husband? Some of you are like, I want my husband to save. No, but uh, no. <laughs> You know, you shouldn't want them. But anyways, we too must go about, like Daniel, the king's business. Remember, he freaked out, but he went about the king's business. How many of you can freak out about the last days, but go about the king's business? We can't just cruise through life, just going to church occasionally, a Bible study once in a while, praying sporadically, and hoping that our loved ones would just get saved. Remember what Paul said, how will they know unless a preacher is sent? You're their preacher. Amen? I don't get to come in your home or your work and go, I don't get to go to Raytheon and say, let me, t- I'm, give me bring your friends and I'll talk to them about Jesus. You're the preacher at work and you need to be praying for them and you need to ask the Lord to open the doors. And guess what, guys? Hear this. I'm gonna, I know I'm going long, but it's just a gift, okay? But here it is. If Caitlyn Jenner does not be afraid to come out, I guess she's having regrets, someone said. But if she's not afraid to come out and remember, do you ever remember Bruce Jenner was a man? Do you remember when he won the trial and she was a stud. Chicks went. When I was a kid, she, oh my goodness, he's so cute. I mean, I don't think any of you girls are going, I can't wait till he's a girl. <laughs> right? But if he can come out and be radical of his diversity, how much more should we be radical about the truth? Amen. We must be about the king's business continually. Daniel rose up and did the king's business, and I pray that that would be the truth for you and I. Amen? Amen. I pray that you'll be a church, that this church is filled, not because of the cool purple lights, not because of the cool, awesome coffee bar, right, that Amy's running, not because of that, but because of you being a witness for Jesus and being about the king's business. Amen? Amen. And you realize that, hey, this ship is sinking, but I want to tell as many people about the life preserver Jesus as possible. I don't want anyone to go down with the ship. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for your love, and I thank you for your goodness. I ask, oh Lord, that you have begun this good work. We'll just continue it, Lord. I pray that your word would wake us up, Lord, all the slumber, Lord, uh, that you would just shake us, Lord, shake the dust off us, shake the apathy, and give us a passion, Lord. I pray that we would not go off half-cocked or, or go zeal without knowledge, but I pray that we would start to pray, Lord, I want to, I don't, all of us here I know don't want to be obnoxious, but Lord, we also don't want to be so politically correct, so, so, so timid that people could stand before us and their white throne judgment, or you know, if we're seeing them, and say, why didn't you tell me? If you knew Jesus was the only way, just like that dream God gave me, how could you not tell me? If you knew that without Jesus I would spend eternity in hell, how could you not tell me? I pray that that truth right now would be loosed in each one of us. That people are going to either maybe could hate us for a little bit now and then come to know Christ, or they could hate us for all eternity because of our silence. Give us a heart that cares more about their soul than how people think of us. Amen? Give us that heart. 
Give us that passion that says, I, like Daniel, want to be about the king's business. He was about a worldly king's business, but I pray we'll be about the king of kings business. And we'll say, Lord, we want to populate, we want to empty hell and populate heaven. We want to be people who share the good news and that everyone around us, everyone in our sphere of influence has heard the good news of Jesus. And we pray that they'll come to their senses and receive you the way, the truth, and the life. Bless your people. Let them be that martis, which means not someone who dies for Jesus, but it means someone who's a faithful witness even on to death if that's what's required of them. Let us not be afraid. As you said in, in, in Revelation 12, they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, sharing the good news, and they did not love their life so much as to shrink from death. Give us that heart that says, I'm willing to die for you if that's what has to happen. If standing up for you means death, then so be it. Give us that heart that's brave. Give us spiritual backbone. And humbly we admit that we can't do this without you, Lord. So embolden us. Empower us. Let us be those righteous men and women that are right with you because you promise in Proverbs, if we're right, we will be as bold as lions. So, Lord, bless your people with a Holy Ghost boldness to speak the truth that you are the salvation of the world, that you are the way. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone agreed said, amen.